we see an almost unending series of changes in the leadership of the military. People take taking some time off to recover and, and people who are needing time to get well and other manner of things are driving a lot of changes. In my mind, almost all of those changes are about loyalty. Mr. Putin is first worried about loyalty, not about military effectiveness, especially in what the army did or did not do to stop Pergozin. I think that Mr. Putin will now choose leaders that may or may not have technical competence, but will be very loyal to him. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And today we are talking to a, we're catching up actually, with General Philip Breedlove, a highly decorated four-star general who served for 39 years. He was commander, US European Command and Supreme Allied Commander Europe from 2013 to 2016. General Breedlove, great to have you again on Frontline. Thank you very much for your time. Um, we last spoke just after the failed Wagner mutiny, an extraordinary chaotic moment in the war in Ukraine. How do you assess the six weeks or so since that? Well, first of all, Kate, good to be back on the program. A lot has happened. And I think the center point of what happened is, uh, is in two directions. First, uh, the continued concern or now understanding that Mr. Putin does not have the vice grip that we thought he had on his nation. In the aftermath of the, the Prigozhin affair, uh, we see that, that Russia is, is challenged internally and it will be struggling for some time. But they did survive the, the, the uh, Wagner Group advance and and now we have to deal with what that means as far as Wagner Group in Belarus. On the other side, of course, it's the story of the counteroffensive, which is clearly now in play. And um, and I must say, we have to deal with what I think was some false or bad expectations by people around the world. There was this feeling that there would be rapiers in the air and flags in the breeze and this massive advance into the Russian lines. And uh, that has now come down to the reality of modern warfare, especially where Russia had months to prepare defensive embattlements. And they have now in most places switched over to, as we understand it, the strength of a defense as opposed to an attacking offender. And so the 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 counteroffensive is proceeding. It's proceeding slower than many would want it to proceed, but they are making progress and they now have a vector which, which would serve to cut the land bridge that is succeeding. They're through the first line of defense and almost through the second line of defense. And we will probably see that now reinforced as a main effort, but it's a hard row and it's costing both, both sides dearly. Just to go back to the kind of damage that that uh, failed mutiny or whatever you want to call it did to President Putin and his forces, um, that defiance, what, what kind of damage do you think that has done to Russia's army? Because it's been followed by a string of senior commanders and soldiers who've been prepared now to, to speak out against the conditions in which they're forced to fight. What's important is the world sees that that Mr. Putin's military is not what we thought it was. Uh, the fact that the Russian military didn't stand up to Prigozhin, I think, shocked uh, Mr. Putin. The fact that some military actually, while they didn't join his side, uh, celebrated with him to certain degrees in the, in the far south, uh, this pointed to the fact that that military is is not what we thought it was, a solid army for Mr. Putin. And now he's got to uh, understand how to deal with that. And the West can sit back and begin to reevaluate what they might see for Mr. Putin's army in the future. And is Wagner now out of the war, even though it's now very much in Belarus? I, I wouldn't count them out. Um, 
What we do know is that Russia needs Wagner in many ways. I mean, within hours of this happening, Mr. Lavrov talked about how important Wagner was in North Africa uh, and there are missions that Wagner will continue to do as a paramilitary organization of the Russian military around the world. Um, I'm told that Wagner is in charge of recruiting for Russia's military. I'm told Ra Wagner is largely in charge of supplying the rations and the sustenance to the Russian military. So this is not an organization that can just be eliminated or cut out. The Russian military rely on them in many ways. And with its presence in Belarus, Poland is clearly feeling threatened. It's sending 10,000 troops to its border with Belarus. Um, what is the greatest risk here? Well, um, the greatest risk is that Mr. Putin miscalculates and thinks that he can start something with Poland via Wagner and that the world will not count it as Russia. We all know that Wagner is Russia. Wagner is a part of the Russian military. Wagner is an extension in many ways of the, the Russian military, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we uh, need to be careful of is that, that Mr. Putin begins to feel like he could use Wagner and, and have culpable deniability. He cannot, and he will not. Um, as far as Wagner threatening uh, uh, Poland, I think in ways of, uh, you know, in, infiltration and special operations, those are things I would be worried about. For Wagner to mount a conventional attack into Poland, uh, I don't I don't expect that Poland would crush them. Uh, Poland's military, as you know, has been investing and in training and becoming stronger and stronger and Wagner would not stand a test in a conventional sense with the Polish armed forces. If, as you outlined, Putin might be tempted to use Wagner in some kind of subversive role in Belarus, um, what kind of message could be sent to deter him from doing that? What does that look like? Uh, we need to make sure to them, and I think we already have, but maybe emphasis would be appropriate, that we count Wagner as Russia. Russia is Wagner. Wagner is Russia. Wagner is a part of the Russian military. Wagner responds to Russian leadership and Russian military control. And so if Wagner takes actions from Belarus, it is the same as Russia taking action from Belarus. We've made it very clear to this point that if, that if uh, Russia incurs on NATO territory, uh, the president and others have said over and over that we will defend every inch of um, uh, NATO territory. So if, if Mr. Putin was to make a very irrational decision and try to use Wagner inside of a, uh, uh, a NATO territory, then he already, I think, but may need to be reminded that that is an act of Russia against NATO in war, and it will be treated as such. Now, if Wagner is to launch against other non-NATO nations, like possibly a different vector into Ukraine, or to actually to overthrow or try to overthrow Belarus or other things, that's a different matter, and they need to be messaged that, that none of that is acceptable. In the meantime, the Russian Ministry of Defense has been trying to reassert its control over its forces following the failed Wagner mutiny. It's tried to shore up the loyalty of the Russian elite airborne forces, the VDV, who are close to Wagner. In what state do you judge the Russian military and its leadership to be? So the Russian military is, is demonstrating in Ukraine that it is. Uh, it has challenges. In some cases, it is not well led. In many cases, it is not well provided for. And we seem to be lacking a more modern approach to war approach. And so uh, the effectiveness of the Russian military on the ground is limited. They have not already not accomplished the objectives that Mr. Putin set out for them. 
And now it's going to be a decision of what they actually come out of this war with. And to correct that, we see an almost unending series of changes in the leadership of the military. People take taking some time off to recover and, and people who are needing time to get well and other manner of things are driving a lot of changes. In my mind, almost all of those changes are about loyalty. Mr. Putin is first worried about loyalty, not about military effectiveness, especially in what the army did or did not do to stop Pergozin. I think that Mr. Putin will now choose leaders that may or may not have technical competence, but will be very loyal to him. You mentioned earlier about the lack of progress on the front line for Ukraine. Um, you said last time um, that you hoped Ukraine would continue its nuanced approach in its counteroffensive. But given how gruelingly this, the pro slow the progress is, what choices do Ukraine's military have? Well, and just not to correct, Kate, but just to get it right, uh, I said that others were expecting this uh, charge with rapiers in the air and flags flying and this dash into Russia. And I, I spoke out that that's what I hope does not happen. They need to take the more nuanced approach and fight in a way that conserves their capability, finds the weaknesses and then exploits the weakness, weaknesses. And I believe that's what's happening now. We saw a certain portion of the force committed, and that was a slow advance. They started to make some advances in a few areas, and then they come under immense pressure from the West to do this faster. Why aren't you doing this faster? They committed another big chunk of their force, and they are now moving again and actually have shown at least one breakthrough that shows promise for accomplishing that cutting of the land bridge. But still, it's going slowly because Russia had months to prepare their defense uh, for this counteroffensive. And, and we also see now that, that Ukraine has still held back some of their force waiting to exploit success. And so my caution, my hope of the West is that we will uh, be patient and allow them to fight uh, and accomplish this these limited objectives that they've laid out. And we are hearing now that dozens of Leopard 1 tanks may soon be heading to Ukraine after they were bought from a private Belgian dealer. It sounds like good news, but is it just a drop in the ocean, this kind of thing? Well, we all need to do more, and I'm particularly disappointed in my country. We we promised them American tanks, and they haven't had a one yet. And it still seems to be a long time before they're going to arrive. Uh, and I, I don't know what's causing all those problems. I believe they're all, if given the proper emphasis, are some. they are something we can overcome. And so I think the West needs to be a lot more focused at getting capability rapidly to the Ukrainians that they can use to make a difference in this war. Um, it's interesting because um, Ukraine's forces, military commentators we've heard from have said things like Ukraine's forces have had to try to create a modern combined arms approach to warfare in a matter of months. The likes of Western countries wouldn't even consider without air superiority. There are suggestions, though, that there is a discussion going on in Kyiv right now about going back to the old Soviet style tactics, just hammering away with potentially huge losses of life. Um, do you know much about that? And what do you think the consequences would be if that kind of uh, switch were to be considered? So, so the, the biggest point to remember here is that we, we have tried to train and instruct Ukraine on how to fight modern maneuver warfare. But modern maneuver warfare requires certain tools. And some of those tools we have not given Ukraine. Uh, first point in, uh, in, the, in the stack is that we in the West have always established at least battlefield air superiority over our fighting forces. The last time that an American was killed on a battlefield to an enemy aircraft fixed-wing attack 
was in uh, April of 53 in the Korean War. We have guaranteed air power, U.S. air power and allied air power and sometimes coalition air power have always established air superiority over the battlefield for our forces to do a combined arms attack. And we have not, we have failed to give them what they need to accomplish that. And we expect them to maneuver like we did. The second thing is our forces have never and would never go to war without its long range artillery. Um, we need to, if we go to war, we're going to strike the enemy's troop concentrations, its supply lines, supply depots deep into the enemy territory. We have not, we have not given Ukraine the ability to do that. We've given them relatively short range capabilities and we've forbidden them from shooting into Russia with those capabilities. We allow Russia to shoot into Ukraine from almost all the way around Ukraine's periphery, 300 degrees in a, in a compass rose around Ukraine. Russia is allowed to shoot into Ukraine, but we do not allow Ukraine to use Western weapons to shoot into Russia at all. And so we have built sanctuary in this way for the Russian forces. And um, that is a tough way to fight a maneuver warfare game when you cannot strike the enemy where he is massing, but rather the enemy is allowed to strike you. And still, I mean, I sense that your frustration in the way you're speaking, and they're still waiting for those F-16 fighter jets, the Ukrainians. And as a former Air Force man, it must be very frustrating. What difference would they make if the Ukrainians had them now? Well, uh, first and foremost, if they had them today, and it, today was the first day that they had them, it would make uh, little effect. You know, bringing the aircraft aboard, incorporating it into the scheme of maneuver, and making sure that they're doing what they can to prepare the battlefield so that they're not wasted. Um, um, this, these are all important things. Once the F-16 or any fourth plus generation aircraft were to arrive, it will take a little bit of a period to begin to bring them into the scheme of battle and have the system prepared to not only employ them, but supply them and maintain them. So um, uh, this is going to be a little bit longer range product process, but it, it's important to start now because every day that we delay is another delay, day before they can be brought to bear on the problem. So um, we need to get started now. And as I have said, and I think you heard in my previous answer, the weapon that makes immediate effect at holding the enemy at uh, risk at range is the ATACMS. Mm. And when you outline um, the expectations of the progress that Ukrainian forces will 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 make um, their use or, or trying to use combined arms without air superiority, and yet they're against this kind of uh, not laid out exactly, but but time frame, a political time frame to show that they can conclude this war on favourable terms. It does seem like it's uh, the expectations are, are extremely unfair on the Ukrainians. We are asking a nation that we, we in the UK, uh, were a part of disarming in the 90s, if you remember. And um, this nation now is facing what we still, to a certain degree, hold to be a world superpower alone. We are, many of us are helping them in a supply sense, in a a support sense, but they are fighting alone on the battlefield against this world superpower, and we're expecting smashing success. And as I laid out in my previous answer, not only are they fighting alone, but we are putting restrictions on them. Russia can amass a force, amass supplies, and prepare for an attack on the other side of the line uh, in Russia or in Belarus, and we forbid Ukraine from attacking them with our weapons. Um, as I said, we have built sanctuary for Russia 
almost all the way around Ukraine. And so this is pretty tough. You would never see Roger Federer agree to go to a uh, tennis match and agree to receive serve for the entire match. Um, we have handicapped Ukraine in this sense. We recently saw the conclusion of talks in Saudi Arabia paving the way for further peace talks where China will again be present like they were this time. They are based around the conditions set up by President Zelensky. No Russia at the table, but growing pressure on it to, to, to enter some kind of talks towards some kind of peace. I mean, what would be the best realistic outcome of these talks in the future, do you think? Well, uh, those are two tough questions to answer, and I'll, I'll divide them right now. You said realistic expectations, and and I would also want to talk to what are, are appropriate expectations. Uh, the world seems to believe that realistic means that Ukraine has to forfeit more Ukrainian territory. Uh, you hear this all the time. What concessions are Ukraine willing to make for peace? And I, uh, I'm not a negotiator. I'm not a, 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 a person who represents in those kind of conversations. Rather, I'm a military person. And so uh, it, it seems to be completely misplaced that Russia has invaded a sovereign nation. And we expect that sovereign nation to give up land to get peace. And that's the wrong starting point. So I think the appropriate thing in a military sense is to discuss uh, those options that start with Russia out of Ukraine and you sovereign Ukrainian land return to Ukraine. And then how do we seek a durable peace? And so in certain senses, these two are at odds in what the world is trying to do in these negotiations. There are those who want to trade Ukrainian land and trade Ukrainian lives for peace. And then there are the Ukrainian people who are ever, every day more and more polling to the point of all of Russians out of all of Ukraine. And so we've got to navigate those waters first. Meanwhile, um, some, what, four to 5,000 miles away, the leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, has fired the head of his army and is calling for the perfect military readiness for war. This is the US and South Korea uh, as they prepare to hold annual military exercises in the region. How seriously should that be taken? Well, like every other threat like that, we cannot dismiss it. We have to be intellectually honest and understand that there is a large and somewhat capable force in the North that that a irrational leader could call into action. We, we have to accept that. But uh, I would just remind that that for years, for decades, in the annual exercises in the South, we get a very bellicose uh, set of rhetoric coming out of the North trying to get the South to cancel. And it, it's done, you know, almost the same every year. I've served four years in Korea. And the, the big exercise in my day was named Ultra Focus Lens. I think now it's called uh, Ultra Freedom Guardian. But the fact of the matter is we do exercise so that we make sure we're ready on some annual, semi-annual basis. And, and there's the other exercise, Full Eagle, which rolls into this as well. And these are designed to make sure that we are capable to do what we say we can do. And that we is bigger than uh, South Korea and the United States and North Korea. You know, we have... United Nations Command, we have Combined Forces Command, and we have the 8th U.S. Army. So in uh, the terms we used to call it, it's SYNC, UNC, <laughs> CFC. All three of these uh, uh, alliances are trying to remain ready. 
And every year, the North tries to threaten the South deeply enough to get the South to cancel the exercise. And just finally, General, um, if you could just give me an overview, since you were Supreme Allied Commander Europe, how much more dangerous do you think Europe and the wider world have become? Very much so. Very much so. Um, uh, we, we are a part of creating the problem in that uh, we have allowed Mr. Putin to get away with uh, invading his neighbors and seizing and holding their land. I would just offer that in my opinion, in 08, when Georgia was invaded, the West's response was inadequate to task. And we rewarded Mr. Putin's bad behavior by allow him, allowing him to hold on to 20% of Georgia. In 2014, Mr. Putin invaded Ukraine twice, first in Crimea, second in the Donbass. And we uh, got quickly to a peace which for a second time rewarded Russian bad behavior and allowed them to hold Crimea and portions of the Donbass. And now we once again in 2023 are faced with how are we going to handle Russia's reinvasion of, of Ukraine. And there are those already calling for capitulation, uh, uh, concessions of land to Russia, and once again, for the third time, rewarding bad behavior. And if we reward bad behavior, reward bad behavior, reward bad behavior, do we expect to get good behavior next? No, we don't. We'll get more bad behavior. At some point, the West is going to have to stop Mr. Putin. Uh, or else he'll continue with what is a very successful gambit so far. And I say that it's time we consider that we have to stop this kind of bad behavior. Now we see that we have encouraged those in the rest of the world. They see that, take action, threaten massive retaliation, expect results. And we have to get past that with North Korea, with China, with Iran, with anybody else out there that believes they can threaten their way to success. General Philip Breedlove, it's been a pleasure talking to you again. Thank you very much for your time. You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio. My thanks to Louis Sykes, our producer. To support the work of Frontline, hit the subscribe button. You can also listen to Times Radio throughout the day or read it at times.co.uk. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.